You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check out my Patreon. And take a look at my other YouTube channels too. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything I release. All links are in the description. In this podcast... Ben Shapiro wrote a rap song. After all that complaining he did about WAP, he decided to make a song that was surprisingly significantly worse. Oh, and it's a total ripoff of Eminem's Rap God. Buckle up, we're gonna listen to some MAGA music. Heck, Owen, I was trying to avoid Shapiro's horrible song. I'm sorry, David Hashman, we gotta hit it. And it's not just Shapiro's either. Oh, you think we're stopping at Ben Shapiro's horrible song? Oh no, no, we've got more. And I apologize ahead of time. Robert Jeffress, historical Trump ally, wrote a new book about the end. Apparently, anytime something happens in Israel, everybody thinks the end is right around the corner. Let's take a look back at who this guy is and some of the dishonest and ridiculous stuff he's had to say over the years, including failed prophecies. DEI has gone too far. Not the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, but the propaganda being spread about DEI. Charlie Kirk and others are using it as a basis for the belief that black people are inferior to white people, and it's honestly wild to see it so brazen and out in the open. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send me an email instead, go to ownmorgan.com and click Contact Me in the menu. I sent a message on my community post asking people to criticize me. I mean, really lay into me. Give me your best complaints and criticisms. I said, I don't like Donald Trump. I'm effectively a Biden supporter in, you know, nominally. I don't really like Biden, but he's the guy I'm voting for. I'm pro-Palestine. I I think that the country of Israel is doing some really bad stuff, the government there. Oh my God, it's terrible. Lay into me. Tell me what you think. Yell at me. Scream at me. Tell me why I suck. 1-800-701-8573. I want to know how you feel about me and my positions. So I, I laid that out on my community post. Still stands. You can still call in if you got messages for me. Let's listen to some of these uh, complaints. Hi, my name's Catherine, and I have a criticism. Your videos are way too good, and I can't stop watching them, and I am addicted to your channel. I love you. Okay, bye. Okay, that was a sick burn. I appreciate that. <laughs> I noticed that when I... I tried to find criticisms, in all seriousness, I really did, but most of the criticisms... I, I did get some honest ones, but most people were calling in to counteract the criticisms. They're like, man, this guy's going to get, he's going to get his ass ripped. He's absolutely going to get bodied here. So I'm going to call in. I'm going to leave a nice message so that he's, you know, he gets a break, like an oasis in the desert. And that was the majority of the calls. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, let's listen to some real criticisms here. We got a real one here. Hey, Owen. My name is Jet. I'm from Idaho. I'm a longtime fan. I've been watching since I was 16 and I'm 21 now. Yeah, five years. That's crazy. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call this a criticism, but I will say that I feel like you pause videos too quickly sometimes. When what? No, I'm just kidding. I'll step back. Sorry. That I feel like you pause videos too quickly sometimes when reacting to them. Like, you'll get, you don't get all the information before you talk about it sometimes. That was all I had to say. Thanks, and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate it. You're right. You're right. I've, I've tried to find better ways to do it, like um, maybe listen to a 45 second minute long clip and then go back to the beginning and cut it up in smaller pieces thought about doing it that way the problem is that in certain increments if it's longer than a certain amount then I'll, it's a lot easier to get hit with copyright so i try to break it down to 10 15 20 maximum 30 second segments but yeah you're totally right i should I should try to find a better way to do it. I don't think I included it in here, but one guy said, I repeat things a lot. I tell the same stories as if it's for a new audience. And it makes it hard for an older audience to stay and continue to listen because, it, you know, there's, it's things that they've heard a billion times. I get that, too. Uh, that makes sense to me. Although I have three YouTube channels and I'm never sure... Which video is going to go to which channel? It just depends on the subject matter. My main channel is primarily about 
cults, extremist religions, things like that, Jehovah's Witnesses. My fireside chat channel is mostly about politics. And my unfiltered channel is about whatever. We just sit there and play games and listen to Nutter Butter, spread Nutter Buttery all over everything. But I can never be sure, like, which audience I am talking to because each channel has its own separate audience. Um, most people don't even know that I have all three channels. They just know about one of those three. So, yeah, I do repeat things a lot. I I'm not really sure how to get around that. I feel like I need to add, a, you know, information to establish uh, certain things before going into subjects, so... I don't know. I'm still I'm still trying to figure it out. If you have suggestions for how I get around that problem, put it in the comments. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Can you repeat that? <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, that's a good one. Neverman is here. Quick interjection. This won't take long. If you like what I do, it would be awesome if you guys checked out my Patreon. All links are in the description, of course. Okay, back to the video. Hi, Owen. This is Daniel um, from Texas. I've been a fan for a while, but I haven't listened as much as I used to. One thing that perennially orcs me when watching you is you have a tendency to use radical or extremist as an inherently negative trait. For the record, I am a leftist, but you know, for my actual point, this country was pioneered by radicals with the founding fathers. A lot of abolitionists went on to form Marxist parties in the Midwest. I'm not saying you can't disagree with these points, but I always thought it was a bit of a simple framing device. It sort of implies a golden mean fallacy that how reasonable you are is directly connected to how closely you align to the power structures that be. And I just wanted to point that out. It always bothered me a bit. But uh, thank, you, thank you for your time. Yeah, I appreciate the call. I, I have thought about that. Now, I don't know what definition others use for radical and extremist, but let me tell you what my definitions are. When I say radical, I mean somebody that is outside of the norm, outside of the common understanding or, or the common culture in society. So in 1843, for example, it was radical to believe that slavery was evil and should be abolished completely. It may have been on its way to being more normalized. Let's say 1790 we'll put it that way 1790 it was a radical position to be an abolitionist right so radicalism isn't necessarily a bad thing there are circumstances in which it is good but extremism is always bad in my opinion extremism the way that i use it is somebody who is outside the norm completely has gone way too far down a path and that path has brought them to an ends justify the means mentality, uh, i.e. the ends for a Trump supporter. The ends are to get Donald Trump back into office. The end will justify anything that they do to accomplish that, their means. So the end is they want Trump in office. Their means of doing so is rioting at the Capitol, taking a hostage, forcing them to declare Trump the dictator, basically ends justify the means that is a bad mindset i don't care what industry you're in i don't care what ideology you hold i don't care ends justify the means mentality is bad period jehovah's witnesses though they're not violent have an ends justify the means mentality and that makes them extremists in my mind extremism doesn't necessitate violence but it lends itself to violence. So that's how I use the terms. I don't know if we're using them the same or not, but now you have a little bit of a glimpse into my mindset on it. I think radicalism is okay in some cases, as long as it doesn't turn into extremism and justify the means mentality and going way too far down a rabbit hole. Hey, Owen, uh, this is Josh from Florida. Uh, there's a YouTube creator called Dark Matter 2525 yeah, totally. I know him. And he just posted a video. Um, I think it's called The One Unforgivable Sin. I think I've worked with him before. I don't remember if I've worked with him or if I know somebody that's worked with him or not. I know I have been very close to somebody that he's been very close with. They're just kind of mutual friends. We We have mutual friends. So I think I've spoken to him before. I just I don't remember. Anyway. The one unforgivable sin, and it goes into basically describing how, like, 
the one sin in the Bible is, that's unforgivable is blaspheming uh, God, like speaking ill of him. And I just wanted to see what you thought about that, because that seems that seems messed up that that's the only unforgivable sin. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know if you want to see that guy's video or not, but I'd suggest it. All right, bye. Yeah, Dark Matter 2525 is pretty cool. He's a, he's a really good guy, from my understanding. As far as the unforgivable sin thing goes, I haven't seen that video from him. Could be worth a watch. Really good guy. Really good creator. Really deep and interesting things. Makes you think. Regarding the unforgivable sin thing, I don't know what that was about specifically, but I know that different denominations have had different unforgivable sins historically. So Jehovah's Witnesses have an unforgivable sin, and it is grieving the Holy Spirit. And that basically amounts to apostasy. It's unforgivable for you to attack God's people, as they call themselves, you know, attack Jehovah's Witnesses when you know that it's true, i.e. you've been baptized, you have sworn your life over to the Watchtower Society, and then left and started speaking out against the Watchtower Society. That is an unforgivable sin. But when you stop grieving the Holy Spirit, i.e. stop speaking about apostate things, then it's not unforgivable anymore. Because you can come in and be forgiven. Like, you're not doing it anymore. It's only unforgivable because you don't stop. That's the idea. So if you're an apostate and you rejoin the religion, you're forgiven. Everything is fine. That's Jehovah's Witnesses' view. Catholics have uh, interesting views. I think that they have some unforgivable sins, but one specifically is suicide. And the reason that it's unforgivable is only on technicality. It's considered murder. And murder itself is even forgivable within Catholicism, as long as you do penance. But that's not possible to do after you've killed yourself. So people who have committed suicide are unforgivable because they haven't had an opportunity to ask for forgiveness, basically. Jehovah's Witnesses don't view it that way at all. They view it as a mental condition somebody was dealing with, and they don't even factor it in to whether or not a family will see the person again in heaven or the new world or whatever it is. It's usually viewed as a, a somber, sad event that could have been prevented had people stepped in and tried harder and done more, or whatever. But it doesn't factor into whether or not they'll see them. Yeah, there are some other denominations out there that believe it's blasphemy. The bottom line is, in my opinion, there really isn't an unforgivable sin. There is so much variation between different denominations. There's obviously no solid information, no solid verse to establish what the unforgivable sin is without question, or there wouldn't be so much question in there in the first place. Anyway, yeah, check out the Dark, the dark Matter video. It sounds interesting. Hey, Owen, I noticed you've been phasing out the Telltale um, name. Um, I've been meaning to call you and um, just tell you that I, I really like that name. Um, I always felt like your niche was that you you actually take the time to listen to what people are actually saying as if they're telling you, you know, telling you what they think so that it's like uh, it's a telltale um uh, you know, it's obvious because they are telling you their tale. I don't know. I always thought it worked. I always liked Telltale. I understand if you're, uh, you know, you're moving on from it, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, I always liked that name. Thanks. I love what you do. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I am moving away from Telltale a lot, although when I started it, it was an Edgar Allan Poe reference, and I, I even had an avatar image that somebody had drawn. I switched it to something that I drew, obviously, but yeah, it was an Edgar Allan Poe like profile picture originally. I'm a big Poe fan. I love a lot of his stuff. Uh, the Black Cat, The Raven, The Telltale Heart. Matter of fact, when when my kid was young... We lived in Florida, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where to go trick-or-treating or anything, but they had trick-or-treating going on at the daycare slash preschool that she went to. So 
I went to Walmart and I got a black shirt, black eyeliner, and I drew whiskers on her and I and black cat ears, you know. And I sent her to school, not as a black cat, but I specifically said to her, tell people that you are the black cat from Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. <laughs> it was so great. The teachers loved it. The, the kids, the fellow kids thought it was really unique and funny. Anyway, it, it was perfect. So I think maybe she's gone as the black cat from Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat since then, too. But anyway... I actually started a publishing company, just a little LLC thing, so that I can publish my own book, because I'm writing a book at this moment. The name of the company is Black Cat Publishing, LLC. I tried to make everything basically references to Edgar Allan Poe. I'm a big Poe fan. I just liked Telltale and the Telltale Heart. I eventually read the Telltale Heart and thought about it. Now, this isn't why I named my channel this, but after the fact, I can apply meaning to the name. If you think about the story of the Telltale Heart, there's a heart beating under this guy's floorboards, right? And it's, he murdered somebody, I believe. It's been a while since I've read I think he murdered somebody, buried them under his floorboards, and he kept hearing their heart beating. It was getting louder and louder and louder. And the police come, and they're knocking on the door, and they're asking what's going on. Person is missing, and he's hearing, while he's talking to the police, he's hearing the, the heart beating louder and louder because the heart will not be silenced. It, it calls out. It must be heard. Everybody needs to know what is going on until the man is driven absolutely crazy and he admits it. He tells people what happened. I'm sure you can see how that applies to my channel. Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, attacked me, tried to silence me, shove me in a closet, keep me quiet, and I'm in the background, beating away, beating drums, talking about what happened, talking about what they're up to, driving them mad by pointing out the inconsistencies and the problems and everything else. Like I said, that was an after-the-fact assessment. That's not why I created the name. I just thought it was a cool name, and I liked Poe. But yeah, thanks for the voicemail. I appreciate it, and I'm glad you like the name. I am moving away from it, though, sadly. Still like Poe, though. Hey, Owen. Guy Young Books from Illinois. Just caught a YouTube clip uh, from Luke Beasley or Kate Collins as interviewing uh, uh, Ralph Norman, the uh, Virginia uh, 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 congressman who called for martial law when, uh, for, for, for Trump to uh, put down uh, the uh, mil use the military to uh, uh, invoke uh, the, the uh, for what the GOP wanted. This is why it's going to be a civil war. I don't, Owen, you got you got to believe this now. You have. All right. So what uh, Guy Young is talking about here? Guy Young's a regular caller. I listen to pretty much all of his voicemails, but they're all, they're not all fit to play on air. Like some of them are just for me to hear, you know, they're not really relevant to what I'm talking about or whatever, but every now and then he's got something good that I want to play to everybody else. Anyway, what he's saying here, I, I believe that is probably in reference to the fact that the Supreme court ordered Greg Abbott, governor of Texas to remove razor wire from the river. People were swimming across the river, refugees and other people who are downtrodden, the weakest among us, if you will, you know, the people that Jesus said we should treat really well, that we should take care of. If you want to get into the kingdom of God, you have to give water to the thirsty and food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, so on and so forth. Yeah, well, those people were swimming across the river to try to get to safety, and Good Christian man, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, put razor wire in the river to cut children to ribbons. And that is exactly what happened. Children drowned to death because the razor wire that Abbott put in there murdered them. The Supreme Court said that it's inappropriate and wrong to put razor wire in the river. You can't do that. Take it out. And what did Abbott do? He said, no. He's keeping the razor wire in there, and he invites all other states who agree with him to send their National Guard troops to the border to continue to fight. All the while, they're naming it an invasion. They're saying it's an invasion of foreign nationals, of enemies who are trying to build an army inside the United States. 
Complete nonsense, of course. These are refugees. All the while rejecting money that Biden offered from the federal government to deal with the border. For the record, there is no real crisis at the border. Republicans have done this since day one. They have always talked about the border in election years and how bad it is and how it's destroying everything and everybody is all going to fall down. We take a look at this one. This is Mark Burns. He was running for Congress. I think he lost. He's a pastor. Anyway, this is 2022. Listen to his strategy in 2022 to get people whipped into a blood frenzy, willing to vote for him. Why are we considering starting a new war for Talking about Ukraine. Or the uh, border of Ukraine and not doing the same for American southern border. Because there is no war happening at the border. Because we promised Ukraine that we would protect them. Because Russia is a historical adversary. Th they view themselves as an adversary of ours, not the other way around. And they're doing everything they can to... Get one over on us, basically. That's why we help Ukraine. As far as the southern border goes, there's nothing happening there, okay? Yeah, sure, there are people down there that cross, but guess what? According to international law, we must create a humanitarian corridor for refugees to make it to a refugee center to apply for asylum. And what are we doing? Putting razor wire in the river so that they get cut to ribbons. So that last one for Mark Burns, that was 2022. Here's one um, back in 2018, just a couple weeks before the voting actually took place in the midterm elections. There was this claim that a caravan of immigrants and terrorists and whatever else were all coming toward the border to what, take America or some other nonsense. And man of God, you know, follower of Jesus Christ, Robert Jeffress on the right here, weighed in on what Jesus would do to those poor, downtrodden, weakest among us refugees from war-torn areas with no food, no water, and no home. What would Jesus do for these people exactly, Robert? That caravan, God intended that that caravan uh, be allowed to cross our border. Uh, I'm paraphrasing him. I mean, but did, does God want that? No, look, God is the one who established borders. He is not a open borders kind of guy. Uh, look at Acts 17. God created the idea of nations, and to, ha to have nations, you have to have a border. And wow, okay. So I guess Jesus would let these people get cut to ribbons by razor wire in the river. All right. My mistake. I guess I just misunderstood Jesus' whole ideology the entire point of his life sorry that's my fault could have sworn john hage talked about this i'm i'm very confident that he did and for some reason i can't find it but the point is every time that there's an election there's somebody out there doing everything they can to scare the Quack. out of old white people claiming that there is a literal army marching across the mexico border it's nonsense it's always been nonsense for the record Immigration is good for a country, extremely valuable. You know, Russia right now has a crisis where their population is falling. When a population falls, an economy falls. There are fewer buyers and sellers, fewer people to watch ads, fewer people to purchase mattresses, fewer people renting apartments, buying refrigerators, fewer people spending money, giving money velocity. When a population decreases, it's almost certainly going to lead to some kind of an economic crisis because the current population is not putting money into social safety nets fast enough to pay out retirement benefits or whatever. Falling population is a bad thing. That's why boomers coming into their prime, you know, coming into the, like their 20s and their 30s and, and working in the, the workforce in the United States, built the economy up, made it bigger uh, and more powerful because there were a lot of boomers. 
and the silent generation or the greatest generation or whoever is the parent of the boomers i don't remember now they spent a lot of time building out a, a, a lot of social safety nets and a lot of civil rights protections and things like that uh, they went through world war ii they fought against nazis and everything the boomers come in and they find themselves in a fantastic economy. And they make it even better by having so many of them. And then they destroyed it, of course, right before the millennials took over. Anyway, Russia is trying to build their economy by paying women to have children. They're, tr they're trying to birth their way into a good economy. We don't have to do that in America. We have people right across the border who want in, who need a place to live, who want to live in a place that's not war-torn. They want to take part in the economy. And what are we doing? Den we're denying them access. Not only are we denying them access, but we are denying them their UN-granted right to apply for asylum by putting razor wire across the river. There is no reason to not allow immigrants into the country. It is only beneficial to a country to bring in immigrants. There are two reasons why Republicans talk about immigrants being evil 24-7. Reason number one, if they frame it up like it's a military coming in to invade and attack and blah, 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 then it scares the bejesus out of people. They will crawl over broken glass to vote for the guy who's willing to put up a wall to prevent them from coming in, even though a lot of immigrants come in by plane or come in legally and just overstay their visas. But whatever, whatever. If you scare people enough, they'll be willing to do anything, even if it's against their own interests. That's reason number one. Now, reason number two people don't like immigrants coming into the country is because of racism, plain and simple. There is no other reason for it. Racism and fear. And we see the exact same thing playing out in Europe. You know, here in the United States, we talk about Mexicans constantly and how they're evil and uh, South Americans, they're coming to take our kids they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, you know, as, as Donald Trump said. In Europe, Muslims are the Mexicans of Europe. Muslims are coming from war-torn areas and looking for refugee status. And what do Europeans do? Demonize them. Say they're evil, they're wrong, they're suicide bombers, they're not allowed to wear hijabs, they have to conform to our way of life or they can't live here, blah, 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 blah. Hate against immigrants is senseless garbage, pointless garbage. It's just used to promote political campaigns, plain and simple. And what is happening right now as a, re as a result of Greg Abbott trying to hurt Joe Biden by claiming that the border, the border is wide open and it's his fault, what's happening is children and mothers are literally drowning to death because they are being cut to ribbons by razor wire. Greg Abbott is willing to literally kill people and reject funding from the federal government to make sure that Biden loses the election. And he, just as Guy Young said, put Biden in an unwinnable situation. He put Biden in a situation where either he responds to the fact that he's refusing to work within the bounds of the law, he's refusing to follow the orders of the Supreme Court, that's sedition at best. Joe Biden would be fully within his rights to deputize the National Guard there in Texas, or I don't know what you call it, take over the National Guard, claim them for the federal government, put Greg Abbott in handcuffs and put him in prison and replace him with a governor who will work with the federal government instead and follow the dictates of the Supreme Court. Biden is well within his rights to do that. What happens if he does? He loses the election because he looks like a tyrant, even though that's not the case. Greg Abbott is fomenting civil war to stop Biden from winning an election. I don't think it's going to actually lead to civil war, but it very easily could, like Guy Young is saying here. It is disturbingly... I think this is the closest that we've ever come to maybe being in a civil war since 1860 something or whenever whenever the civil war started 1861 maybe or 58 i don't know it's disturbing to see straight up i agree
Texas has wanted to break away from the United States for a very, very long time. Well, they may be trying to take their chance. If they do try to do that, Biden will absolutely deputize every police officer and National Guard member and everything, everybody, everywhere in the state of Texas. And he will kick out every single politician and he would be within his rights to do so. I hope he does. Probably won't, but one can dream. Anyway, tell me what you think about it in the comments. Thank you for the uh, voicemail, Guy. I appreciate that. It was it was pretty interesting. It was a good opportunity to talk about what's happening in Texas. It deserves more attention than it's getting right now, honestly. Next up, Ben Shapiro wrote a rap song. After all that complaining he did about WAP, he decided to make a song that was surprisingly significantly worse. Oh, and it's a total ripoff of Eminem's rap god. Buckle up. We're going to listen to some MAGA music. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. Most of you guys probably know Ben Shapiro. This is him on the left. There is some weird trend going through the MAGA movement of people who want to make rap songs and they suck at rap, mostly. In this case, Ben Shapiro absolutely sucks at rap. I don't know if you guys were paying attention at the time or what, but there was a song called WAP by, who was it? Was it Nicki Minaj? It was Cardi B, sorry. Yeah, I think it was Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, and so on and so forth. Anyway, Cardi B, yeah, she did WAP. And, uh, <laughs> God, Ben Shapiro made such a fool of himself. Like, he goes through this song, WAP, referring to it as wet ass p word the whole time that's what he said wet ass p word <laughs> so stupid dude i love it man anyway so he decides to make a fool of himself once again surprised let's listen to his absolutely fantastic rap song and see how it sounds i just so happen to be a rap connoisseur personally so i feel qualified to judge the quality of his rap song check this out Let's look at the stats. I've got the facts. My money like Lizzo. My pockets are fat. Let's look at the stats. My pockets like Lizzo. My wallet is fat. Wow. Is that a fat joke against Lizzo? He can't just leave her alone, can he? The facts. My money like Lizzo. My pockets are fat. Homie, I'm epic. Don't be a whap. Dog, it's a yarmulke. Homie, no cap. Look at the grass. Look at my charts. You're blowing money on strippers and cars. Okay, well, he's not doing... All of these rhymes are single-syllable rhymes. It's all pretty straightforward stuff. And by the way, uh, it's not lost on me that this is a complete ripoff of Eminem's rap god. This is exactly the setting that Eminem used. He stood there in a hoodie, in basically a black background with some yellow electrical things around him. And he had the TVs all over the place. By the way, love these CRTs. Big CRT fan right here. Who has two thumbs and is a massive fan of CRTs. This guy. Anyway, let's keep listening. Quick interjection, this won't take long. If you like what I do, I'd appreciate it if you watch the video to the end. YouTube bases video reach off of watch time, so watching even an extra minute makes the video go further. Liking and subscribing goes a long way too. Finally, it would be awesome if you guys checked out my Patreon. All links are in the description, of course. Okay, back to the video. By the way, love the shirt also. Facts don't care about your feelings. Okay, great. Facts, my money like Lizzo, my pockets are fat. Homie, I'm epic, don't be a whap. Dog, it's a yarmulke, homie, no cap. Look at the grass, look at my charts. You're blowing money on strippers and cars. You go into prison, I'm on television. Dogs, no one knows who you are. You're going to prison, I'm on television. Dog, no one knows who you are. Is that what he said? I'll put up the words, so like as he says them when I do the edit, so you guys can see exactly what's being said here. But... For the audio audience, at the very least. I guess he's just, like, making fun of poor people. Okay, great. Make fun of poor people. Fantastic. All right. Listen, I'm on television, dogs. No one knows who you are. Keep hating on me on the internet. My comment section all woke Karen's. And I make racks off compound interest. Y'all live with your parents. Okay, now he's expressing his distaste and disdain about the fact that people on the internet are criticizing him. Okay, first of all, he's intelligent as it gets. He's entirely too intelligent to believe any of the stuff that he espouses. I don't believe it for a second that a Jewish guy, Orthodox Jewish guy, wears a yarmulke everywhere he goes, has ingrained himself in a movement full of Nazis and believes that this is the right way to go. No, I don't believe it. I just don't. So he's trying to make fun of people because 
they're criticizing him for being absolutely terrible. For, in my opinion, just straight up lying to further his goals and interests and in the process furthering the goals and interests of the Nazi movement as a Jewish person. So he's saying, you live with your parents, and I'm making rap songs. Great. Good for you, Ben. I make racks off compound interest. Y'all live with your parents. Nikki, take some notes. I just did this for fun. All my people, download this. Let's get a billboard number one. That is the clunkiest rhyme I think I've ever heard in any rap song in my life. I'm sorry. That was just bad. For fun. All my people. Download this, let's get a billboard number one. This ain't rap, this ain't money, cars and clothes. We ain't selling drugs, we ain't gonna overdose. Okay, the chorus is okay, it sounds to me. Ben isn't even trying to sound anything. He's just, he sounds like garbage. I don't know who this guy is, but he's got a decent chorus, right? Why does he have a little thing behind him showing that he's over six feet tall? That, that, I don't even believe that. When you're trying to make it clear to me how tall you are, I don't believe you. Selling drugs, we ain't gonna overdose. We ain't pushing guns, ain't promoting stripper poles. We won't turn your sons into thugs or your daughters into hoes. I gotta say, great rhymes. I appreciated those rhymes. That was a good chorus. Complete, utter, uh, complete and utter garbage in every other way. The lyrics were complete nonsense. Talking about... They, how they won't turn your sons into thugs and daughters into hoes. Give me a break, bro. Look who's on the moral high ground as he promotes the Nazi movement. Yeah. Hope you're happy with yourself, Ben. I don't think moral when I think Ben Shapiro. I think enabling Nazis. In fact, hiring a Nazi. He hired Candace Owens, who is a Nazi. This dude is Jewish and hiring Nazis. He has no place to talk about moral superiority. I don't care if I offend you. I was put here to upset you. Okay, you don't offend me. I just think you're a fool. I think that you're lying, seemingly intentionally. It's not about being offended. It's not about facts, not caring about your feelings. Oh, my feelings, they don't hurt. I just think you're a scumbag for hiring Nazis. That's all. By the way, Michael Knowles is also employed by the Daily Wire. I don't necessarily think he's a Nazi. I think that he has similar interests to the Nazis, namely taking out the LGBT community through violent genocide, but I don't call him a Nazi. I only call people Nazis if I believe that they really are, if I think that they hold the ideals of the Nazi party, and that is Candace Owens to a T, in my opinion. The guy is hiring Nazis. Talks to us about moral superiority. Yeah. Quick note before we continue, I'm writing a book about my experiences inside the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. I cover the culture and doctrine. It's understandable even if you know literally nothing about the religion, so I'd appreciate it if you gave it a read. To find out more, go to owenmorgan.com book. All links are in the description, of course. Okay, back to the video. I don't care if I offend you. I was put here to upset you. Okay, I'm not offended. I just think you're a scumbag is all. Is he, like, trying to offend me? Like, bro, you failed. I'm not offended by this. Like, you, every time you say something, every time a word comes out of Ben Shapiro's mouth, it just betrays how much more a scumbag he is than I originally thought that he was. I don't like, um, I don't like insulting people. That's not my thing. I don't want to be the guy that's always bagging on people, right? But I don't know how else to say it. Ben Shapiro is a scumbag for the things that he does. You know, if he really believed the things that he talked about, I, I don't know that I'd necessarily say that. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, I, don't, I think they're true believers. I don't think they're scumbags. I think they're deeply damaging to society. There's a difference. Shapiro is both deeply damaging to society and knows that he is and is doing it anyway. That makes him a scumbag in my eyes. Okay, 
If you want my pronouns, I'm the man. I'm the man who don't respect you. Okay. Is he going to give us the pronouns at any point? He said, if you want my pronouns, I thought pronouns would follow. What are his pronouns then? Is he saying his pronouns are the man? And again, right here, blatant ripoff of rap god from Eminem. Bro, get your own material. Get your own music video, okay? It, at this point, it's hard to tell if this is satire or not. Was he joking or was this real? Anyway, that was uh, Ben Shapiro's rap song. Tell me what you think about that one. Sadly, though, that's not the last rap song we have in queue. I figure it would be worth our time to go back and look at some MAGA rap. There's some good MAGA rap, honestly, like really good right-wing extremist rap out there, surprisingly. Most of it, not so much. Some of it is pretty good. There's a guy named Forgiato Blow. I don't know if you know who this is, but uh, this is him on screen right here. He's got this weird neck beard looking thing, whatever. And uh, yeah, he's dancing and singing and rapping and all that other junk. Listen to this one. This is called Patriot Sweep. It has Roger Stone, as you can see. And it's about all of those poor, persecuted January 6th people who didn't do anything to anybody. And they're being persecuted by the federal government for no reason. So sad. By the way, if you don't know Roger Stone, I think this event sums him up perfectly. He started out in his political career early on, in his early 20s, maybe even late teens, working for the the Nixon campaign. He was involved in the Nixon campaign during Watergate. He denies being involved in Watergate to any degree. I don't believe him. I just don't. Has a gigantic tattoo of Nixon on his back, I believe. Anyway, he famously made a maximum donation to a political campaign, to his rival political campaign, uh, $10,000, or something like that, got the receipt and slipped the receipt to the news. He donated it from the Socialists for America Foundation. A fictitious foundation. He just made the whole thing up and slipped the receipt to the news so that he could demonize his enemy as somebody who supported socialists, who socialists support. That's the kind of scumbag stuff that this guy does. That's who he is. He met with the leaders of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the everybody else the night before, I think, or a couple nights before. January 6th actually took half. Uh, I'm sorry, a couple nights before January 6th actually took place. There's even video of it. Do you want to know who the connection was? Between, between Donald Trump and the January 6th rioters, Roger Stone. He was charged with a crime, I don't remember what it was, for receiving hacked materials from Russia through Guccifer 2.0, the hacker, and releasing them into the public. I believe that that was uh, Hillary's emails. He was sentenced to jail and everything. And at the last second, wouldn't you know it, Donald Trump comes in and pardons the guy. So he is who they decided to get on this song called Patriot Sweep. You know the fans that are sweet, they was knocking at the front door. Patriots pulling up, knocking on the Capitol. You know the fans that are sweet, whoa. You know the fans that are sweet, whoa. Yeah, painting them like criminals, those poor January 6th people who were looking for a hostage so they could force the U.S. government to keep their guy in office and turn it into a dictatorship. Poor guys, huh? Got a feel for these people. These poor guys who were violently busting windows in looking for an opportunity to take hostages. Yeah, totally innocent. Just nice guys, you know? They were just nice guys protesting, using their right to protest. That's it. Nothing more. Sure, they showed up with gloves so they could bust windows in, climbed in, walked around, and opened the door for other extremists while looking for hostages. Okay, you got me. They're just honest patriots, okay? Oh, and there's the QAnon shaman. Look at that. 
He said he was let in by the police. Huh. That's weird. It was violent. It was a violent coup, and they knew what they were doing. There were weapons stashed around the city, buried, ready to be dug up and handed out to militia members when they finally got their hands on a hostage. There was a militia waiting across the bridge to come over the moment that it was time. This was not just patriots using their First Amendment right to protest. Now, these people were scumbags. They knew what they were doing. They participated in an insurrection against the U.S. government. And Roger Stone even got sentenced for some seditious stuff. I don't even remember what it was. And pardoned by the insurrectionist president. So I don't want to hear any of this nonsense from these people. You know the fans, the sweet Sick beat though, right? Dude, I, I honestly, I like the beat and I like the, uh, the visuals. I think the visuals are really good, but they are criminals. Went to D.C. to spread peace, you say? Peaceful protesters. Interesting. Huh. So what was that we just watched? People busting in windows. Weird. Why were there more guns in the Middle East? Peculiar. Curious. These people are so completely full of... <laughs> oh, and by the way, if you really cared about the January 6th people, why didn't Donald Trump pardon them on his way out of office? I'll answer it for you. I know why. Because he's looking out for his own best interest. He knew it would look bad if he pardoned the people who he inspired to commit an insurrection. He knew that would look absolutely terrible. He didn't want to have that on his reputation. So he just walked right out and damned people to 20 years in prison, some of them. Well, they damned themselves, but he let it happen. In fact, he encouraged it. So, like, nothing about this music is attached to reality at all. Talking about Ashley Babbitt, probably. She wasn't a patriot. She was an extremist. She saw a gun. She was alerted to the fact that there was a gun because a guy next to her yelled, Gun! And she continued to climb through the window. I have the footage. I have completely unedited footage from two angles in my clip collection. OwenMorgan.com slash clips if you're curious. I can't play it on YouTube because apparently it's heavily regulated and age-gated. Maybe for good reason. She was not a patriot. Okay? She was trying to get to Mike Pence to kill him, to take him hostage. Tell me how you feel about that. Who want Trump one? Who want Trump one? Watermark the baddest 45 the chosen one. You know the feds did a sweet They was knocking at the front door. Patriots pulling up, knocking on the Capitol. Okay, I really like that chorus. That is on point, right? God, I wish that he wasn't absolutely psychotic. And I could actually appreciate this. I would probably listen to this guy if he wasn't a complete nutcase. You know the feds did a sweet roll. You know the feds did a sweet roll. You know the feds did a sweet They was knocking at the front door. Patriots pulling up, knocking on the Capitol. Yeah. You know the feds did a sweet roll. You know the feds did a sweet roll. Joe had a choose a sleep in parking lots. It was hell. Trump gave him brooms in his DC hotel. Before I read MAGA, they said I'm Illuminati. You can't. Okay. Trump gave him what? Trump gave him brooms in his DC hotel. Gave them booms in his DC hotel. Trump gave them boom. I don't know what that means. <sighs> anyway, that's that's MAGA rap. I mean, that's what the right has to offer as far as rap goes. Sick beat, sick chorus, absolutely unhinged from reality lyrics from Forgiato Blow. Literally everything about Ben Shapiro's song is complete garbage. <laughs> I mean, I guess the chorus in his song was okay. Keep it real facts, don't care how you feel, man. If you want my pronouns, I'm the man, I'm the man who don't respect you. 
I mean, it's still completely unglued from reality. But Ben Shapiro needs to stick to arguing with people rather than singing straight up. This for fun. All my people download this. Let's get a billboard number one. This ain't rap. This ain't money. Cars and clothes. We ain't selling drugs. We ain't gonna overdose. We this is painful. This is painfully stupid. You think that's all we got, don't you? No. Oh, no. We have more. As it turns out, MAGA nutcases have been making rap songs since the dawn of time, practically. Here we have Hank Kuhneman, who's about to rap for Jesus. Hank Kuhneman, by the way, if you don't know, he is a far-right MAGA preacher who, well, you know what? I, just listen. By the way, this one is from uh, late December 2021. Let's rap together. Are you ready? Let's rap together. Play me some rap music. Where's this going to go? You don't even know how to rap, do you? <laughs> no, we realize that might be offensive because he's black. Okay. that That's classic Hank Kuhneman. Do, do you even know how to rap? Oh, yeah. I want you to know as we go that there is something that is true all about you. Dude, I love it because it's so bad. You see, 2022... It should be known to be true. Yeah. Hey, I'm talking to you. Wait, 2022 will be known to be true? Um, okay. This is late December 2021 when this came out. So I guess he's claiming that 2022 is going to be like some special year or something. And the devil shall be bound and brought under your feet to the ground. Because the Holy One shall arise and bring you a surprise okay um ad hoc rhymes aren't terrible so far i suppose it's gonna be a year that you don't have to fear because the king shall remember you that, that was clunky and terrible that last one the rest of the rhymes were so so that one was bad i'm sorry man Look, guys, stay away from rap, okay? I'm begging you. You know what? Stay away from music entirely. It's garbage. Check this one out. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a short one. Robin Bullock. Grab a jackal by the leg, shake him like a dog, throw him all across the ground. Grab a jackal by the leg, shake him like a dog, and throw him across the ground. Maybe don't mistreat any animals. How about that? Of course, when he says jackal, he means Joe Biden. So I guess he, in this moment, he's imagining grabbing Joe Biden by the leg and shaking him and throwing him somewhere. Okay, great. Stay away from music, guys. I'm begging you. Then there's this classic one right here with Jeremy Levy. Honestly, good voice. This dude's got a beautiful voice. Except the psychotic stuff coming out of his mouth destroys anything good from this song. We've got genuinely famous people in this one. Liz Crokin, Jeremy Levy, of course, went pretty far in American Idol, I believe. We've got General Flynn. I'm sorry. I keep messing that up. We've got Michael Flynn, no longer a general since he had his rank stripped of him. Who else was in this? Uh, Greg, Greg Stinchfield. Big Nick is in there. Uh, one of the Pussycat Dolls is in here, too. I don't remember who everybody was, but lots and lots of famous people. Just listen for a second. It says, amidst a firmament consumed by the oppressive grip of government overreach and tyrannical control, a man by the name of Jimmy Levy emerged, poised to make a difference. Fueled by the Holy Spirit, he set out to bring together a group of gifted individuals. United by a common thread, they poured their souls into recording the timeless and evocative hymn of freedom. A hymn. It's a hymn about Donald Trump. Well, including Donald Trump at the very least. Take all our money, but you can have our soul. You can burn down our buildings and we'll still find a home. We will all stick together and we'll never surrender. We won't give up our freedom. Dude, I honestly love this guy's voice. I think he's absolutely on point, but there is something evil about his beard. I don't know what it is. I feel like it's staring back into my soul. Something not right about that beard. Freedom, there were 
bright lights before it all went to dark. And their white lies, they divided our hearts. What the hell does that mean? There were bright lights before it went to dark, and their white lies divided our hearts? Is that what he said? What does that even mean? I don't understand. In the blink of an eye, we were all left with scars. Listen to man made decisions, should have trusted God. Okay, another beautiful voice, although I think this is auto tuned to hell. But what what are they even talking about? I don't understand. They were traumatized? Is that what he said? In a blink of an eye, we were left with scars. What scars? What was this blink of an eye moment? What are you even talking about? God, these people are perpetual victims. You can take all our money, but you can't have our soul. You could burn down our buildings, and we'll still find our home. Which person on set here had their home burned down by somebody? In fact, which person on stage knows of a specific building in their neighborhood that was burned down? Name one. That didn't happen, okay? I live in New York City, you know? The place that was burned down a couple of years ago? It's fine. It's better than ever. It's always been fine. Okay, all of that burned down nonsense was fabricated by Fox News to scare the shit out of old white people. It's garbage. It always was. New York City is fine. Oregon is fine. Washington, Seattle, wherever else they claim, the Louisiana, they're all fine. They always have been. There are no buildings burned down. Buildings, and we'll still find a home. We lost it. This is the Pussycat Doll, by the way, from that from the band. Very, very famous. We will all stick together and we'll never surrender. We won't give up our freedom. Auto-tuned to hell, that one was. That was that was bad. From the shores of California, all the way down to the keys. That's for Giotto Blow. Only he will bring closer when we fall to our knees michael flynn <laughs> i love that man he's he did he just spoke it like he didn't even try to sing it i don't know maybe his singing would have been worse than if he had just spoken it <laughs> that was just bad man that was just bad closer when we fall to our knees like i can't even imitate how robotic that sounded <laughs> Oh, I love everything about it. Oh, and here's Big Nick's part. And you lift us from the ground so that everyone can see that we never lost our freedom. It's in his glory. It's in history? We've never lost our freedom? It's in history? What? No, you're correct, good sir. You have not lost your freedom. You never did. It was never on the line. I have no clue what these people are going on about right now. They live in an alternate reality. Oh, you think we're done now, don't you? No, we're still going, baby. We've got more. And we're not going to go through the whole thing, but Greg Locke, of all people, did a rap song. I just want to go through the whole set of MAGA music. Greg Locke is a far-right televangelist, and you know, evangelical megachurch pastor type of guy. In 2013, he made a rap song, um, October 3rd. 2013 and he released it to his youtube channel rev rhymes that's what he calls himself rev rhymes i'm serious oh god all right listen there are more people in the bondage of slavery today than at any other time in the history of the world i don't even know if that's true probably not 40 percent of all of our missing children in america are caught in sex trafficking rings that's false. The average individual that is trafficked is sold for $90, and 75% of them are sold by someone that they know very much. Okay, you think that people are worth $70? Is that what he said? $70 to buy a person? Or did he say 90 I don't remember. People are not that cheap, bro. They weren't that cheap in the Civil War. They're not that cheap now. This whole sex trafficking thing, it's a fabricated problem. That, you know, sex trafficking is an issue. That's true. But QAnon, 
this is actually pre-QAnon, so Greg Locke's fictitious imagination of the sex trafficking industry, completely made up, all of it. QAnon claims that 400,000 people per year are sold into sex slavery, basically. No, that's false. The metric they're working off of is actually there were 400,000 missing persons reports one year when they were looking at this stuff. That includes people who were eventually found. That includes kids who ran away from home and were communicated with eventually. That includes kids who wandered off at the mall, found a Baskin Robbins while mommy was at Claire's looking at their necklaces and their earrings. Mommy turns around, doesn't see the baby. Well, the baby is like inside of the freezer eating the ice cream out of the gallon jug, you know? Oh, little Timmy was in there the whole time. Okay, call it off, officers. We found him. I don't know what percentage it actually is, but it's not anywhere near what they believe it is. I mean, they use, when I say they, I'm talking about QAnon and Greg Locke here, obviously. These people use the missing persons reports as the basis for the claim that, like, sex trafficking is absolutely rampant and it's all over the place. Yeah, it's a problem in the world, absolutely. But it's not a problem in the way that they believe it to be. But, you know, I'm not even going to bother. Let's just keep listening to Rev Rhymes here. Bust a few lines for us. I'm not I'm not really a fan of the beat. Rev Rhymes. Rev Rhymes. <laughs> this is bad. There's an evil in these streets, but people, they keep walking. The government is hush-hush and preachers ain't talking. Everybody's quiet as a mouse. Cause you don't get concerned unless it happens in your house I see it on the news all the time So no more can I keep silent so I'm busting out this rhyme Okay, he should have made it a lot faster And he should have picked a different beat This beat is bad in my opinion He's got like that little whistle in there and everything It's just not good It's, it, there's something about it that sounds terrible and contrived Just like Ben Shapiro's song The rhymes aren't Terrible. They're not fantastic, but they're not terrible either, I suppose. Silent, so I'm busting out this rhyme. It's time to lift the lid on a subject that ain't nice. They snatching up our kids, settling them out like they merchandise. That was a good rhyme. We've overlooked it like a big misplacement. Not thinking about the girls beat up naked in a basement. There's no hope for victims. Placement, basement. Yeah, that was good. That was a good rhyme, I think. Basement. There's no hope for victims, only danger. Forced all the time, having sex with a stranger. I know that sounds so dirty, you'd rather turn your face. But you can't sit there silent and still preach about his grace. It's gonna take an army to stand against this wrong. It's become an epidemic that's now 30 million strong. Uh, this is just completely fabricated. What is he standing on in this picture? Is he just, is he like acting like he's standing in front of a gate or something? Like, I don't know what this is. Anyway. Rev Rhymes is terrible. Forgiato Blow is good, but absolutely psychotic. Jeremy Levy, good, but psychotic. Ben Shapiro, psychotic and bad. Okay, don't. Just find a new... Look, you're fine where you are. Write books, talk online, argue with people. Don't get into the rap game, Ben. For everybody's sake, I'm begging you. On the internet, my comment section all woke Karen's. And I make racks off compound interest. Y'all live with your parents. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. I think it's complete garbage. Next up, Robert Jeffress, historical Trump ally, wrote a new book about the end. Apparently, anytime something happens in Israel, everybody thinks the end is right around the corner. Let's take a look back at who this guy is and some of the dishonest and ridiculous stuff he's had to say over the years, including failed prophecies. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. There is a fear that if the left ever regains control of this country again, our nation is finished. And look, I said this on Fox and Friends yesterday, and the president retweeted my comments last night. Uh, look, the Democrats knew they couldn't beat him at the ballot box in 2016. They are becoming increasingly aware of the fact that they can't beat him in 2020 either. Oopsie daisy, sounds like a false prophecy to me. I don't know if this is a prophecy. This might have been a uh, prediction rather than a prophecy. But the guy speaking in that clip 
was named Robert Jeffress, and he's extremely influential within the televangelist community. You may not have heard of him because he works behind the scenes a lot, but he's extremely influential. Oh, my God. He knows Donald Trump. He's worked with Donald Trump. He, he's been retweeted by Trump a thousand times. He is one of those evangelical leaders that Trump calls when he needs something, when he wants to bolster his credibility or his image among evangelicals. He's a televangelist, effectively. So Jeffress had a prediction for us. He said, Donald Trump is unbeatable in 2020 at the ballot box. So Democrats are trying to impeach him. I think this is from 20, when was this? 2019. Yeah, this is early October 2019. So one year before the votes are going to be cast for the 2020 election. Keep listening to what he had to say here on this radio show he did. Impeachment is the only option they have to remove Donald J. Trump from office. Of course, he wasn't removed from office, and the impeachment really had no effect on him at all. Uh, this guy was just complaining about absolutely nothing. And look, I heard the sanctimonious Nancy Pelosi this weekend calling for prayer for our country, and praying for prayer. Look, that Praying for a prayer. Go on. It reminds me of an arsonist, a pyromaniac with a match in his hand about to set a building on fire saying, now pray with me that the destruction I'm about to cause isn't too severe. So this guy is saying that impeachment is basically burning the country down. Is that what he's saying? It sounds like a runaway analogy to me. Cause isn't too severe. I mean, if he's sincere, he'll put down the dang match. And if Nancy Pelosi is sincere about bringing this nation together, she will drop this impeachment effort. Let the American people decide one year from, to now, from now at the ballot box. And that they did. The, the American people decided overwhelmingly that Donald Trump should not be in government at all. Shouldn't be anywhere near it. Of course, they just deny that and pretend that he was elected, blah, blah. I mean, that's all they do. Just lie about it constantly. Biden got like, I think, 10 million more votes or something like that than than Donald Trump did. Of course, it was a lot narrower than that because of gerrymandering and the Electoral College. I think Biden won by about 40,000 votes across three states. Trump won against Hillary by about 70,000 votes across five states. But Biden got 10 million more votes than Trump overall. The people spoke. The people wanted Biden, not Trump. Simple as that. And of course, this guy is going to make all kinds of ridiculous claims to make it out as though he was right all along. That's the evangelical playbook. Ballot box, but she is uncomfortable. She's scared to death. At Talking about Nancy Pelosi. What the American people will choose to do, and that is to keep Donald J. Trump in office. You know, we just assumed. Yeah, I mean, that would be scary, but the, the people chose, so. Donald J. Trump in office. You know, we just assume they're praying to God. I, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, Dr. Jeffers. I mean, they booed God, tried to vote him out of the party plant for him. I mean what? What is he talking about? Who booed God? Tried to vote him out of the party platform. What? I remember this. This was being spread around the Republican Party for a while. It was a claim that Democrats removed God from the party platform and said that they were the party of the atheists, I think. Matter of fact, so this one, this is Brenda Kuhneman. She's Another supposed prophet of God, you know, that, that type of person. This is from 2022, late January 2022. I can't find anything, and believe me, I've looked, anything on the left that is good to support. Let's see, ending slavery. Yes, it still exists. I would love to end prison slavery. Uh, equal rights for everybody. There are a ton of things on the left that are totally good to support. Not to mention the fact that the stock market does significantly better under left-leaning presidents than it does under right-leaning presidents. That's neither here nor there. Okay, it's filled with lies and homosexuality and abominations. And, you know, in fact, the party, I'll just say it, the Democrat Party put straight up on their platform, on their platform, that we are the party of the non-religious. We don't want God. We're atheists. That's what they've said. You can go read it yourself. No, you can't because it's fake. Is that what this guy, Robert Jeffress, is talking about right now? It's another one of those things. It's like 
the claim that Obama killed Christmas, not allowed to say Merry Christmas anymore. Uh, no, that never happened. What are you talking about? It's completely fabricated. Like these people live in an alternate reality. They must be doing this knowingly and intentionally, right? They can't possibly believe any of this. I'm quite sure. I don't know, Dr. Jeffers. I mean, they booed God, tried to vote him out of the party platform. No, they didn't. It's like when you hear somebody say something so direct and brazen, you got to think like they wouldn't lie to your face, right? There's got to be a grain of truth here. No, there isn't. They're just lying, flat out saying false things. I mean, well, and apparently the God they uh, worship is the God uh, of the uh, the pagan God of the Old Testament, Moloch, who allowed for child sacrifice. I mean, the God of the Bible doesn't sanction the killing of millions and millions. Oh, no. <laughs> go, go ahead. Finish your sentence there, Robert. The God of the Old Testament doesn't sanction the killing of millions of what? I mean, the God of the Bible doesn't sanction the killing of millions and millions of children in... Yeah, he kind of does, actually. In fact, he did it multiple times in the Bible. There's a standing order today. If you find any Midianites, you're supposed to murder them as a Christian or as a Jewish person. I'm not sure. And I, maybe it's not Midianites. I don't remember. One of the groups that God had genocided at his command, whichever one that happened to be. The point is God ordered genocide like nonstop through the Old Testament. But that's neither here nor there. Now, I understand what he's talking about here. He's taking a shot at Roe versus Wade. He's talking about taking a shot at abortion. That's not what's happening. It's not a baby when it is literally 150 cells. When it is... Uh, do you know how many cells there are in the brain of a fly? To, there are about 150 cells in a blastocyst, right? A very small, fertilized human embryo. 150 cells. Would you guess that there are a thousand cells in the brain of a fruit fly? Would you guess there are 50,000, 80,000, 100,000, 150,000, 200,000 cells in the brain of a fruit fly? We're talking about 150 cells in a blastocyst. So I don't want to hear any of this nonsense about it's a baby and God loves babies and you're killing babies. Blah, blah, blah. It's completely made up. Fruit flies and mosquitoes are brainier than you think. They have about 200,000 brain cells providing a baseline for their complex behaviors, say scientists who counted the bugs' cells. 150 cells. Stem cell research was banned because people were taking an egg and a sperm cell and joining them until it was like 150 cells and using that to heal people, to cure cancer to cure blindness to regrow limbs but it's banned because it's a baby no it's not god did sanction genocide though i can't believe he even went there who allowed for child sacrifice i mean the god of the bible doesn't sanction the killing of millions and millions of children in the womb well he did that all the time i think the god they are worshiping is the god of their own imagination Says Robert Jeffress. You've got to love it. Anyway, I want to go through Robert Jeffress again. I want to talk about him because it's been forever since we've talked about him. He's releasing a new book, believe it or not. The title, Are We Living in the End Times? Listen to his ad on Fox News. Terrorist attacks against Israel, escalating threats of a third world war, natural disasters and civil unrest are causing people to wonder, are we living in the end times? In I mean, there has literally not. Do you know how many years of peace there have been in the past 6000 years? I just read this in my fun fact book. Hang on. Let me look it up. Make sure out of the past 3400 years. There have only been 268 years of peace, just 8% of recorded history, according to the New York Times. 268 years of peace out of the past 3,400. So go on about World War III. Keep, uh, keep telling me. What are you asking me now? 
disasters and civil unrest are causing people to wonder, are we living in the end times? In his new book, Are We Living in the End Times, trusted pastor and best-selling author, Dr. Robert Jeffress provides solid biblical answers to seven key questions, including what role does Israel play in the end times? What five headlines will signal we are in the end times? And how can you prepare for the end times? Are We Living in the End Times by Dr. Robert Jeffress. Dude, I should get this book and read it on stream. I think that'd be fascinating. Robert Jeffress is available right now at ptv.org and wherever fine books are sold. Jesus said, no one knows the hour or day of his return, which is why we should be ready at all times. Jesus is coming back to earth one day. Are you ready? Get your copy of my new book, Are We Living in the End Times? Okay, that's going to be a hard pass for me. No, thank you, sir. I find it interesting that he's, like, promoting his book, though. I, I think this was on Fox News, this ad was. I had no idea how expensive books were to produce, but how much money they can generate. I mean, I'm not looking at selling anywhere near as many copies as Jeffress is selling. Jeffress will probably sell 30,000 copies. That's my guess, 30,000 copies. Just hypothetically speaking, if he sells it for 30 bucks and he spends five dollars per copy on editing and printing and binding and cover art and the everything else all of it say five bucks a copy goes to the publisher or whatever he sells thirty thousand copies twenty five dollars each that's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars it is so easy to get filthy rich with a book if it sells well i'm not expecting mine to sell anywhere near that well oh my god that's like New York Times bestseller territory. That's just not happening for me. But my point is, that's why Jeffress is shouting out his book. If he gets even a hundred sales from this Fox News ad or whatever, he's made three thousand dollars right there. Anyway, I, I just want to talk about who this guy is because he's worked behind the scenes for years and years to erode separation of church and state. So let's talk about probably his most famous clip here. Give this one a listen. This is from mid-June 2020. Here's the question. There are those that would say that... There are those that would say weasel words right out the gate. Go on. The separation clause of the Constitution would mandate that all public discourse be totally secular. No. Okay, first of all, there's no separation clause. What are you talking about? It's the Establishment Clause, not the Separation Clause. And what did you say that it does? All public discourse be totally secular. No, it says that the government cannot force people to be part of a state religion. It can't make any laws establishing a religion. It can't favor one religion over another. That is what the, the Establishment Clause says. And it was clarified in great detail by Thomas Jefferson in his letters to Danbury Baptist Church. Like, e even the question asked is nonsense. But okay, go on. Do you believe that the Separation Clause mandates secular discourse? By the way, he said there are those who would say, who? Who would say that? Nobody. Well, first of all, there is no separation clause. Correct. It's the Establishment Clause. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. There's no such thing as a separation of church and state. Well, Thomas Jefferson did write a letter to Danbury Baptist about separation of church and state. That's where the term came from. He said there should be a wall between church and state. He said there shouldn't be a connection between the two. They should stay completely separate. Now, you can disagree with him on that if you'd like, but he said it. That was part of the government. He was the president. He went on to become the president after saying that. And he and the Supreme Court worked together to establish what we understand about the Establishment Clause today. How do they misunderstand the first sentence of the First Amendment of the Constitution? You, you can't convince me that they believe any of this. They're doing this to further their goals, right? They cannot be this ignorant on the subject. ...of church and state in the Constitution. What the 
First Amendment says is, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion or, uh, the free, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Right. Separation between church and state. Church will do what it wants to do. State will do what it wants to do. And they will not meet. Their paths will not join at any point. That was the goal. And again, it was clarified through countless Supreme Court rulings, letters to different churches between the Founding Fathers and, and others. We understand this without question. And he knows that. Prohibiting the free exercise. Oh, and by the way, what the hell is he holding right now? Why is he holding like 16 books? He's speaking to an audience. What is he even doing right now? Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Our forefathers came from another country where there was a state-imposed church. Yep. Where people were forced to worship. They wanted no part of that. Absolutely. That's correct. Yes. They said, we're not going to allow government to establish a state church and coerce people to worship in it. Well... They said we well, they said more than that. If you've read the letters between Jefferson and Danbury Baptist, which they're available, I've read them on stream before, you'll see that the founding fathers, the presidents, the signers and framers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the other founding documents, they did not want church and state to meet. You can disagree with that assessment. You can say, well, I think they should or whatever. But trying to change the interpretation of what they plainly said is a joke and, and shameless. They're just lying. And coerce people to worship in it. That's all it says. It has nothing to say about Ten Commandment displays in schools. And what do you think that is exactly? A school is a government program where kids are mandated to show up it is a government controlled and sponsored education center what would you call it when a teacher who is you know endowed by the state to disseminate information about the world around us to students and if the student doesn't show up the parents go to jail they are compelled to show up they must be there so the state is forcing children, which I'm in favor of, by the way. I'm, I'm fine with that. I think it's good for kids to go to school. I'm just, I'm saying the kids are forced to show up and listen to what this agent of the state has to say to them. Now, what would you call it when this state actor starts pushing religious beliefs down people's throats? I would say that's the government establishing a religion, wouldn't you? I would say that's the government favoring one religion over another. No, it didn't mention the Ten Commandments because the Founding Fathers didn't think people would be too stupid to understand what they meant. But here we sit. Nothing to say about Ten Commandment displays in schools, nativity scenes in the public squares, or prayers at the graduation. In 1980, the Supreme Court in Stone versus Graham said... Wait, 1980? Wait... Wait a minute. This is the thing that we were listening to earlier. 1980 Stone v. Graham. Okay. Uh, we're going to look that up in a minute. Let's just keep listening. 1980 Stone v. Graham. It's at the graduation. In 1980, the Supreme Court in Stone v. Graham said, you can no longer display the Ten Commandments in a Kentucky school. Can't even display them, much less teach them. <sighs> yeah. That's because that is a state institution establishing a religion, favoring one religion over another. How would you feel if they put a statue of Shiva the Destroyer right in the center of the school that every kid had to walk by and look at every single day of their lives? How would you feel about that one? He would throw a hissy fit. You know, if a statue of Shiva was placed in a school for students to walk by every day, he would lose it. By the way, just think about the term hissy fit and its origins. It's kind of funny when you think about it, right? My cats throw hissy fits all the time. When they're hungry, they swat at each other and they, they get they get all they get into hissy fit mode. It's bad. <laughs> Gotta feed them on time. Anyway, Robert Jeffers is throwing a hissy fit here and it's ridiculous. Get over yourself.
even display them, much less teach them. What's interesting, Clark, is 118 years before that, a similar case came before the Supreme Court of whether the Bible could be read in school. And the Supreme Court said unanimously, and I'm quoting, why may not the Bible, especially the New Testament, be taught as God's revelation? Where can the principles of morality be so clearly found than the New Testament? Now, that was the Supreme Court 118 years earlier. Okay. 1844. This is... I, I looked into this case, and my wife looked into the case, too. Before talking about the case, I want to point out that this is like, right now, in history, 2024... We have a group of Christian nationalists, these people, for example, trying to put Ten Commandments statues into schools, right? Obviously. We have people trying to force pictures of the Ten Commandments in every single classroom. And it's working in some cases. What he's doing right now is similar to if somebody in 200 years looked back to the 2020s and said, why was it okay in 2020... For them to put up Ten Commandments statues all that time ago, but we reversed it. That's effectively what's happening right now. He is effectively using incorrect Supreme Court rulings that did not represent what the original founders wanted. He's using those rulings as the basis to establish more wrong rulings. Now, not only is he doing that, but he's getting the case completely wrong. That is not what the case is about at all. My wife is in law school. She's going to talk about the case just a little bit. So I'm going to flip the microphone over to her. All right. Y'all are going to have to bear with me. Sorry. I'm not on stream. I have a face mask going. So, okay. So I'm not a fan of trust in estates and I'm not a fan of 1800s Supreme Court case ruling. So, you know, it's th this was something to get through for me, but this. Essentially, this case that's being talked about, uh, Vidal versus uh, Gerard's executors, it's a case about, like, can somebody in his will give property over to a city in order to establish, like, a school for orphans? It's not doing what the guys are talking about. It's not saying that, you know, the Bible needs to be in schools at in the what was specifically referenced in that clip was dicta it wasn't the holding of the case basically the part that's being referenced is this giant long paragraph that is basically just rambling it's not really building up to anything about the actual holding of the case the thing that's precedential it, instead it's just kind of like you know, 1800s prose. Eventually, though, the point of this case was the person who was giving the land over to um, the city of Philadelphia, I believe it was, said that they could, they he wanted a school to be established as long as there wasn't religion being taught. And under this holding, basically, that was, as far as I can tell, because again, this is 1800s in trust in estates, they basically said that's fine because he's not going against the common law of Pennsylvania, which included a blasphemy statute, a blasphemy statute that was actually only found unconstitutional in 2010. But because of that, it, it, it was fine. They're actually, the holding of this case again, from what I can tell, is just saying, like, it's all right for there not to be religion in schools, going against what the guys on stream are saying. It's an absolute mess. And really, the only thing they're doing is showing that they don't understand how to read a case or how uh, case law works or how precedents work. Because, you know, even if I'm completely wrong about my understanding of this case, which is very, very likely considering, again, trust in estates, 1800s. The thing that would have said, like, you can't impugn Christianity was found unconstitutional, like, 14 years ago. So they don't really have a leg to stand on here, but that's not really surprising considering the Christian nationalists. They never have a leg to stand on. 
Okay, so that was a summary of why the guy is completely wrong in what he said about that case. The bottom line is the guy was, from my understanding, cherry-picking things from the case. The case wasn't even about what he's saying. All that stuff was like superfluous language that had nothing to do with anything. The case was about, all right, a guy left, I think, $7 million dollars to a charity and wanted that money to be used to create a school or orphanage or whatever charity that did not use the Bible as classroom materials. And it, that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the question was all really about... Uh, basically, it's about whether a city can like establish this orphanage, this charity that was devised to it in a will. It's all about like inheritance law, nothing to do with like religion and an establishment of religion. Right. The case was actually, um, I think the, well, one of the parties was the executors of the will. So the point is that this had nothing to do with what he's talking about. Is anybody really surprised by that? The reason that I wanted to go so deep into understanding what this case is all about is because all you have to do is search, why may not the Bible, in quotes on Google, and you get like a billion Christian websites holding this up as the bastion of, oh, this is exactly what everybody thought, until those evil atheists came along in 2019 and decided to insert the separation of church and state that wasn't there before, blah, 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 you know. That's the kind of thing that, that these people do. So I wanted to make sure that this is not representative of reality, what he's saying. I wanted to really understand one way or another. And I came to find that he's completely full of it, of course. Is he lying on purpose, knowingly? Is he accidentally lying? Is he spreading misinformation by mistake? Or does he know what he is doing? Either he heard that from somebody who was intentionally lying, or he found that case and intentionally lied about it. Somewhere along the way, somebody intentionally lied about what he just said, about that quote. This is a complete misrepresentation of the entire thing. I know it's a little thing, but think about it. This is what the far-right Christian nationalist group does. They pick little things and turn it into something that it absolutely wasn't. And they use it to bolster their own credibility. Teach them. What's interesting, Clark, is 118 years before that, a similar case came before the Supreme Court of whether the Bible could be read in school. No, it was not about that at all. It had to do with charities and how they're established and how religion interacts with charities. Something to that effect. And the Supreme Court said unanimously, and I'm quoting, well, the vote was unanimous, but what he's quoting from was the opinion piece, which was, this is part of the dicta, and that the dicta means it was superfluous aside from the main point. It was just extra stuff. It's just extra. It was not relevant to the, the case itself. They, they just added this in because it was kind of tangentially related a little bit. Why may not the Bible, especially the New Testament, be taught as God's revelation? Where can the principles of morality be so clearly found than the New Testament? Now, that was the Supreme Court 118 years earlier. Well, that was probably the guy who wrote the Supreme Court's opinion, um, majority opinion. I, I guess there was no minority opinion because there was no minority. It was unanimous and every time i'm on fox debating some of these pinheads from the aclu pinheads <laughs> oh people just going nuts you're clapping their hands raw they're left with stubs at the end rubbing them against each other because they're so glad to hear somebody taking a shot at the aclu those terrible losers the religious aspect was secondary to whether someone could give property to a city for a specific purpose as part of their will that was the point of the case. Tell you. Stupid ACLU pinheads. I asked them the question. I say, now tell me, why is it in the mid 1800s you could read and teach the New Testament, but suddenly the Supreme Court decides 118 years later that you can't even post the Ten Commandments? I'll tell you why. 
as a matter of fact, because A, you completely misinterpreted what that case meant, and B, they got away from what the Constitution originally intended. They got away from what the framers of the Constitution, the presidents of the time, the founders, the writers of the Constitution, you got away from what they wanted. I'm sorry, they got away from it. In, in the 1800s, they were changing the way things worked to be more religious. They established a state religion effectively in the 1800s and mid-1800s after the framers were dead. Now, after that absolutely insane explosion of right-wing traditionalist Christian nutcases died off, we all kind of got back to what the framers intended originally, which was a separation of church and state. We're not even fully there. But obviously we have quote-unquote pinheads trying to cram religion down our throats once again. You know, I'm not sh I think this probably came out after the clip that I'm about to show you. So if you saw the previous video that released, or maybe it released on my main channel, I'm not sure, you've probably already seen this video. Let me just show you just a second of this House member in Texas absolutely shredding this woman. And it's not one that I want to be a part of. It's not one that I think I am a part of. You know that in Scripture it says faith without works is what? Dead. Is dead. My concern is instead of bringing a bill that will feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, we're instead mandating that people put up a poster. Poster of the Ten Commandments in every classroom in Texas. Instead of actually increasing food stamps to help the hungry, instead of creating a, a clothing program where people who don't have clothes for school can go to the, this warehouse and get clothing, instead of creating a program where the homeless can have a home, can have stability, as Jesus taught, as Jesus taught was a prerequisite for entering the kingdom of God, instead of any of that, they're trying to post a graven image in the classroom. And what is our buddy Robert Jeffress doing? Is he following Jesus' example? 18 years later that you can't even post the Ten Commandments. What changed? Did the Constitution change and nobody told us about it? No, the people in 1844 changed their, their interpretation of the Constitution, tried to shove religion down everyone's throats. After all those nutcases died off, we got back to what the founders originally intended. Of course not. The Constitution hasn't changed, but what has changed is this. We have allowed the atheists, the secularists, the humanists to hijack our Constitution and pervert it into something our forefathers never intended. That's what the problem is. I'm going to say this, and it may cost me some book sales. But oh, I bet. It's going to cost him some book sales. Oh, boy. Yeah, just wait. His, his voice is going to crack like he's a 12-year-old girl in a second. Yeah, he's going to say the hard things, right? I love God. That's hard to say. Nobody likes to hear it. It's going to cost me some book sales because I'm going to say it anyways. God is the best. He is such a martyr, dude. Get over yourself. I want to say this, and it may cost me some book sales, but I'm going to say it anyway. Thank God. God, we have a president like Donald J. Trump who understands that. Absolutely cringy, dude. Does it get more cringy than that? I just want to play that for you one more time so we're all on the same. Look, see him sticking. He's got his tongue out right now. He's going to squish his tongue down a little bit, right? See, sticking his tongue down, and then he's going to yell and let his voice crack on the way out as loud as he can. Thank God we have a president. <laughs> Oh, Robert Jeffress. Yeah. Boy, he definitely lost some book sales for that one, I bet. Thank God we have a president like Donald J. Trump who understands that. Yeah, totally. Lost some book sales to that one. One more thing from Robert Jeffress I want to show you guys. This one's already getting a little bit long, but let me just show you a little thing from this guy all the way back from 2018. Yeah, okay, so there was an election on its way. This was late October 2018, so the election was like within weeks, I think, of when this came out. It was a midterm election, so voting for the House members, the senators, and so on and so forth. Something I noticed that you'll notice, too, if you haven't already, 
is that every time an election comes around, all the Republicans talk about is the border. You won't hear another thing from them. Have you heard a word from Republicans about abortion in the past six months? It's a subject that they completely avoid. Yeah, I'm looking at old clips right now, and we've heard some people talk about it in old clips. But this is a subject, abortion, that people won't touch with a 10-foot pole because they know it's toxic to them right now. But you know what they think isn't toxic to them? I want to ask you about Governor John Kasich saying uh, that that caravan, God intended that that caravan uh, be allowed to cross our border. Caravan of illegals, quote unquote. In 2018, these people were losing their minds because there was supposedly a caravan of illegal immigrants who were passing through Central America and through Mexico trying to get into the United States. And who knows, there might be terrorists in there. I'm not even joking. That's what they were saying at the time. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? Uh, I'm paraphrasing him. I mean, but did, does God want that? Does God want the poorest, the most downtrodden, beaten down, the hungriest, the thirstiest, the, the homeless among us to be able to find some security in life? That's a good question. What would Jesus do in that case? If Jesus found somebody who had nothing but the shirt on their back, had nothing to eat or drink and nowhere to live, would God, would Jesus want them to be allowed in? Look, God is the one who established borders. He is not a open borders kind of guy. Uh, look at Acts 17. God created the idea of nations, and to, ha to have nations, you have to have a border. And look, Lou, I got to be with the president today in the Oval Office, and by the way, he sends his greetings to the... Wow, look at this guy. Important. He knows the president, or the president of the time, of course, Donald Trump. The way that they twist things around is honestly incredible like you got to give them props right they deserve kind of a clap for that for how absolutely wild it is to listen to them twist things completely out of proportion like i don't even know where he is now i can't see him from where i'm standing he is so far off in the weeds with this jesus wanted people to care for their fellow man that was the prerequisite for entering the kingdom of God. You fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You gave me a, a place to sleep when I had nowhere to live. And the sheep said, Lord, when did we do any of those things? And he said, what you did to the least of my family, you did to me. What is an immigrant, or uh, let me rephrase, not even an immigrant. What is a refugee, if not the least among us, the, the most downtrodden, the people in the worst positions in life, the people who've lost everything to war and famine and pestilence. What are they, if not the least among us, the ones that need the most help? And what are God's sheep doing right now for those people? Did, does God want that? No, look, God is the one who established borders. He is not a open borders kind of guy. So, no, God doesn't want people to take care of the poor and the downtrodden and the weakest among us, if you will. He wants to force these people to die on the other side of the border. You know what God wants? He wants to put razor wire in the water to cut children to ribbons if they try to swim to safety. As Greg Abbott did. Yeah, Greg Abbott is doing God's work. Absolutely. You know, I don't believe in any of this. But if there, if there is a hell, and if the Bible really was real, these people are going straight to hell. Really. Greg Abbott? Straight to hell. No purgatory, no nothing. He's going to hell for the shit that he's done. Robert Jeffress, televangelist. Kenneth Copeland. Greg Locke. They're going straight to hell if this is real. After all the things that they've talked about and advocated for and all that other stuff, it's disgusting and evil and wrong and does not represent what Jesus stood for to any degree. Anyway, tell me what you think about these people in the comments. I'm truly deeply disgusted by their positions on like literally all of this. This is just wrong and it does not represent what the Bible says or reality. Tell me what you think in the comments. Next up, DEI has gone too far.
Not the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, but the propaganda being spread about DEI. Charlie Kirk and others are using it as a basis for the belief that black people are inferior to white people, and it's honestly wild to see it so brazen and out in the open. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon, and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description turbulence hits or when you're flying through a storm and you're like i'm so glad i saw the guy with the right stuff and the square jaw get into the cockpit before we took off and i feel better now thank no, you i mean about like that. you want to go thought crime like i'm sorry if i see a black pilot i'm gonna be like boy i hope he's qualified that is charlie kirk if you're unfamiliar he's a far-right extremist nutcase who seemingly is just looking for a reason to hate black people if you're unfamiliar with, like, the thread that brought him where he is right now, let me just tell you what happened, okay? There was a door plug on a 737. It's a Boeing plane, or a big plane. It was a commercial plane that had passengers and everything. Well, the door plug had some loose bolts, and it basically flew off mid-flight. And uh, apparently, like, nobody died. Everybody's buckled in and safe, luckily. Oxygen masks fall from the ceiling. Lights are flickering. Everything is a complete mess. People's phones fly out of their hand. One kid sitting near the uh, the door that, that flew off, his shirt ripped clean off his body, flew right out the door. It was crazy. And it was a, a, a big thing. And sh not long after that happened, that event, this article on the Babylon Bee appears. Boeing CEO assures nervous flyers that all 737 aircraft are built to the highest diversity standards. Now, what was really to blame for this event? I'll tell you. Poor maintenance requirements, cost-cutting techniques, not running planes through multiple levels of security checks and maintenance, making sure that they're all safe and clean and the bolts are tightened and all of the other stuff. That's really what's to blame. They were cutting costs by avoiding extra maintenance steps or extra security stuff or whatever. That's what caused this. But the Babylon Bee and the far right in general, including Elon Musk, claimed that it was because there was diversity in the company. There's a DEI program, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The claim is they're hiring black people and black people are inherently inferior to white people. If you see a black pilot, you should be worried because he is not qualified to work there. That's the, the meme, the idea they're trying to pass off. They found their, when I say they, I'm talking about Charlie Kirk, Elon Musk, people at the Babylon Bee, and the people that read the Babylon Bee. They have found their reason to be racist. They were looking for a reason. Here it is. And I feel better now. Thank you. No, I mean, about like, that. you want to go thought crime? Like, I'm sorry. If I see a black pilot, I'm going to be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. Because black pilots are almost certainly only there because they were forced to hire the black pilots. It's absurd. It is an excuse for racism. Nothing more. On screen here, we have Wendy Rogers. She is a state. House of Representatives member, I believe, for Arizona. She's close friends with Charlie Kirk. She's actually been on Charlie Kirk's program plenty of times. And she is close friends with Nick Fuentes. She has supported Nick Fuentes. She's shown up to Nick Fuentes' concert, or I'm sorry, to his conferences. If you don't know who Nick Fuentes is, he's a Nazi. He's a full-blown Nazi. He likes Hitler. He thinks Hitler did a good job and did not go far enough. He's disappointed that Hitler died because he wanted Hitler's goals to come to fruition. Wendy Rogers likes Nick Fuentes and has shown up to his conferences. So I want to put this in context. Oh, and she's close friends with Charlie Kirk. Weird little connection there. Listen to what she had to say on this DEI thing. As someone who's actively uh, aviating in our skies. Actively aviating. Well, it doesn't look like you're actively aviating. It seems like you're actively sitting at a table right now. I am very troubled by the DEI influences in the airlines. She's troubled by the fact that there's somebody that's not white working for companies? 
And uh, even though it's purportedly incentivized to implement DEI and supposedly helps a company financially, it compromises public safety. It compromises public safety to have black pilots. What? How? What is she talking about? You know, this sounds like she was looking for a reason to be racist, and she found one. Look, there is a disparity between the black community's level of education and wealth, generational wealth, and the white community's generational wealth and education. Now, that can be the result of one of two things. Either it's genetic or it's cultural. If it's genetic, you're a Nazi. If it's genetic, if, it, if, if black people have less generational wealth and less education for genetic reasons, you just believe that they're, they're physically inferior to white people and can never match up to white people. They can never meet that bar no matter what. They're just inferior. If you believe that, you're a Nazi. Nazis believed the same things about Jews. If it's not genetic, it's cultural, we can fix it. You know how we fix it? Rise people up out of poverty. Give them more opportunities at education. If they go through the educational process and they become qualified to work as a pilot or to work as a whatever, they are just as good as white people. Just as good as everybody else. If it's cultural, it can be fixed. And we should be pushing programs to make people more equal, more, make things more fair. But when all you know is privilege, equality feels like oppression, of course. So which one is it with Wendy Rogers? Does she think that it's genetic? Black people are just inferior to white people inherently, genetically? Or do you think that she recognizes that there's a cultural imbalance? The only way that Charlie Kirk or Wendy Rogers or any of these other people could possibly live in fear that there's a black pilot, the only way they could justify that is by believing that it's genetic, that there's some inherent inferiority about black people. So go on, Wendy. Tell me about how you feel about the black community. I'm very troubled by the DEI influences in the airlines. Troubled by the fact that airlines are including black people in their crew. And uh, even though it's purportedly incentivized to implement DEI and supposedly helps a company financially. It's not that it helps a company financially. It helps a company. Diversity makes things stronger. Any system benefits from diversity. People from all backgrounds come with different perspectives and ideas and feelings and opinions and thoughts. When you bring people from different backgrounds together, they come up with incredible ideas. Just imagine bringing a chemist and a physicist and a mathematician together in a room. They come up with absolutely incredible things that a chemist could not personally alone come up with. When you have people who are white and black and Native American and, hell, Russian and Irish and Chinese and Japanese and everybody, when you have people from all different diverse backgrounds come into a room and try to figure things out together, they come with new perspectives and ideas. The only way this works in Wendy Rogers' head, the only way that her opinion makes any sense is if white people are superior to everybody else. It should only be white people in this equation, apparently. It compromises public safety. So with that, safety should triumph over financially incentivizing a company. And with that, I vote aye. Absolutely disgusting. I guess that's our sign, isn't it? She believes that it's genetic, apparently. 
I mean, this DEI thing has not stopped there. Like I said, I tracked this down, and I talked about it in another video not too long ago, but I tracked it down to one of two people. This is where it started. Either the Babylon Bee or Elon Musk's tweet. They both released on the same day. I'm leaning the Babylon Bee probably started it, and Elon Musk most likely saw the Bee article and repeated it. That's my guess, because Musk posted around 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., I'm no, there's no timestamp on the Babylon Bee article, but it says amid growing concerns over safety after several devastating mechanical failures on Boeing 737 9 Max aircraft, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun assured hesitant travelers that all their aircraft are built according to the highest standards of diversity. Of course, it's fake. It's a lie. It's a joke website. It's satire. It's not real. But people don't seem to realize that. As I talked about in the other video where I, I brought this article up, this is posted on Reddit on r slash conservative, and there were three types of comments on there. The first comment that I saw, the first type was, wow, the bee really got him this time. Savage. Yeah. Those people recognized that this was satire. It was a joke. The second subset of comments that I saw was, People think this is satire, but it's really happening. It's not, but that's what they believe, apparently. So they see this Babylon Bee article, this satire article, and they believe that it's actually happening and they're satirizing real life. The third subset of comment that I saw on the subreddit post was, this is just wrong. These people want to kill us all, or something to that effect. Buying into it. They believed that this was real. That is where this whole DEI fear-mongering campaign came from. And now we have Floyd Brown, campaign chairman for Cary Lake, on national TV talking about DEI. I've been grieved since Barack Obama became president. We've actually gone backwards in race relations. And he's created so much division. And these DEI... Yeah, it was Obama that caused division. Totally. Absolutely. And he's created so much division. And these DEI programs just really, uh, they, they, they're, they're negative for everybody, including black Americans. Because, you know, uh, Ben Carson was one of the great all-time surgeons. And yet... Was? Was one of the great all-time surgeons? Uh, ben Carson was a good surgeon, yes. But he's famous for having separated conjoined twins i believe but it turns out that he was one of like 70 doctors on that team he wasn't the only one it's amazing i mean i, I don't want to downplay his accomplishments i just want to point out that he wasn't the only one doing the job but sure okay yeah he's a good surgeon great go on one of the great all-time surgeons and yet now because of dei when you see a black surgeon, you, 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 you get a question in your mind. Who does? Me? Are you saying me? I do? No, I don't. Are you getting a question in your mind when you see a black surgeon? Have you ever asked yourself why you get questions in your mind about black surgeons, black police officers, black, I don't know what, black airline pilots, black whatevers? Have you ever asked yourself why that is? Do you think maybe there's something down deeper in you? Why do you think black people are inferior to white people? You, you get a question in your mind. And what you want is you want the blacks that are on top, that do succeed, to be there on their merit. Because they absolutely have as much merit as anybody else. Brother, they are. They are there because they have merit. Diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are intended to bring in people who have just as many qualifications as everybody else. They're, they want to make sure that they're not completely white employees because there are plenty of qualified black employees too. That's what the DEI program is for. Bring in a diversity of thought and background as long as they're qualified. On job postings, there are requirements if you want to be an airline pilot, no matter what, you must have a certain number of flight hours logged. Oh, I don't know. What are the requirements? 
Okay, look, this is on Indeed.com, okay? This Indeed article tells us what the requirements are to be an airline pilot. Earn an FAA-approved bachelor's degree. Most major airline companies require a bachelor's degree in aviation or a related field when applying for jobs as an airline pilot. You can fo- If you can follow an airline pilot career path, the most common step students take is to go to an FAA-authorized institution where you will take aviation-related coursework. Number two, obtain a private pilot license. Three, acquire an instrument rating. Flying for an airline requires reading and using instruments. Once you earn a basic pilot certificate, you'll need to train to use sophisticated instruments that guide a plane through different weather conditions and altitudes. Number four, obtain a commercial pilot license. Five, get a flight instructor certificate. Six, add a multi-engine rating. Seven, gain experience and flight hours. Yeah, you need 1,500 flight hours, I believe. Earn an airline transport pilot certification. Interview for a position as an airline pilot. All this stuff is required to be an airline pilot. If you notice, there isn't a if you're black section. This is just how to be an airline pilot. There is no how you become a surgeon if you're black section of an application process. They don't even ask you your skin color. Uh, All this nonsense about they're not there on their merit. No, they are there on their merit. They must have qualifications. They must. It's just they want to bring in a diversity of people. Maybe make their company representative of society. About 15% of society is black. So maybe we have 15% of the company be black. Honestly, it's not even that. In most companies that have... DEI programs, it's still only like 5% black at most in some cases. But totally, yeah, there's a separate application process apparently for black people. Question one, are you black? Question two, can you read? If you answered yes to both of those, you're hired. Welcome aboard, you're our new airline pilot. This is a joke. These people have found their cover to be racist. They were looking for a reason and they found it that are on top, that do succeed to be there on their merit because they absolutely have as much merit as anybody else. As if that's a completely different situation, as if that's not how it goes right now. These people are shameless. Floyd Brown is terrible in more ways than that, though. Like, DEI doesn't even begin to touch the problems with this guy. He was on Flashpoint. I don't even remember when. When, when was this one? Yeah, it was late January 2024 when he was on Flashpoint. So just a few minutes before the clip that we just watched, listen to what else he had to say on Flashpoint. Floyd, full disclosure here, you're not just the founder of Western Journal. You're also Carrie Lake's uh, manager, campaign manager. That's correct? I get that right? Well, my title is campaign chairman. That's what I said, uh, campaign chairman. No, it's not. You said campaign manager. Why do people do this? This guy just drives me nuts. I don't even know what to say about him. That's polite. Yeah, and I'm I'm very active in the campaign and 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 very close to uh, both her and her husband, and uh, they're just wonderful people. And and uh, I really felt led of the Holy Spirit to be involved in her campaign as as uh, as as part of my 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 worship in 2024. Wow, as part of his worship, he decided to get involved in the MAGA movement on Carrie Lake's behalf. When I hear stuff like that, it just blows me away, man. He is saying that the MAGA movement is his religion. God told him through prayer that he needs to be involved in helping Donald Trump and his allies. That is psychotic. What is wrong with these people? Something deeply broken here. By the way, I would love to see this guy's qualifications. How did he get into his position as campaign chair? Anyway, these people are just grotesque. This is absolutely wrong. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. They're shameless. That's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check me out on Patreon. And take a look at my YouTube channels. Owen Morgan, where I talk about religious issues. Telltale Fireside Chat, where I talk about politics. 
Telltale Unfiltered, where I do long-form breakdowns of stuff like this, and Telltale Reads, where I read books by televangelist and others. I release everything in parts, but every part stands independently of the last, so you can jump in anywhere and I'll make sure it makes sense. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of all my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything. All links are in the description. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.